I'm Sarah Wilson and you're listening to the Roots and All podcast. I'm here to help you get growing. Join me as I explore everything plant related both indoors and out and provide the information you need to create your perfect green environment. Hello and welcome to this episode of the podcast. This episode is part two of the Design Expert series that has very kindly been sponsored by the London College of Garden Design. If you're interested in studying garden design or planting design, the college is based in the UK at Kew Gardens and they've recently launched the London College of Garden Design in Melbourne, which is based at the Royal Botanic Gardens Victoria and will be offering courses from 2020, so that may be of interest to Australian listeners. I'm following a number of this year's London students on Instagram and I have to say, the quality of work they're producing, even though they're only a third of the way into the course, is absolutely mind-blowing. So keep up the good work, guys. You really are smashing it. So my guest for this episode is Kim Wilkie. Kim grew up in the Malaysian jungle and the Iraqi desert before moving to England to attend school. He's a prolific landscape architect who works on large-scale projects in the UK and internationally, in both public and private spaces. He works on a scale that is beyond the experience of many, if not most, designers. For example, designing the green spaces around an entire new city in Amman, or his 100-year Thames landscape strategy that encompasses the land along the River Thames from Richmond to Kew. Arguably, it's necessary on any project to tie together the culture, history, geology, the people, the place, but never is it more important to get this right on projects of this scale, where human experience is being shaped through what happens in the landscape on a huge scale and will be for generations to come. Kim's book Led by the Land explores just that, how he is led by the land through every part of his design process. We discuss many of the things he writes about in the book throughout the interview and I started by asking him about an idea he mentions early on which is the interest gained from a landscape that is kept in an adolescent state. Well my first question is that you mentioned in the introduction to Led by the Land that the goal of our landscaping and land management is to keep landscapes in a state of adolescence. Can you explain what you mean by that? Well the I'm not saying that it's it's a goal, but that actually some of the most interesting and richest landscapes are ones that are are arrested in um, adolescence, which um, basically it means that um, most um, ecological systems will um, gradually develop towards a a climax system. And in in somewhere like Britain, that tends to be oak woodland um, and... uh, and it's it's a fantastic, mature um, system, but because um, because of the progress to that that final um, state, some of the interim adolescent states before you get to full maturity um, are, by in terms of biodiversity and ecological um, diversity, really rich. So things like water meadows and coppice woodland, and um, and in particular, um, things like uh, wood pasture are really rich because of the different sorts of habitats that are all combined together in a mosaic. And so um, what's fascinating about historic landscapes, um, particularly since the last ice age, is that way that human interaction with the land, when it's done with respect and um, good stewardship, produces amazing biodiversity. So the ecologist Colin Tubbs, um, who, who did an analysis of when biodiversity was richest in, in Hampshire, um, expecting to find it sometime um, thousands of years ago um, before too much intervention by man, actually worked out that in the mid-18th century, um, there was the greatest biodiversity because of the way that people were farming very intensively, but with uh, a stewardship that, that worked with um, pasture, with um, meadows, with wood pasture, and with um, forestry. And, and the combination of all of those made for maximum biodiversity. So contrary to um, the expectation that human beings have to be bad for the environment, Actually, farming well means they can be extremely good for the environment. 
Mm, yeah, I thought that was fascinating. So talking about people who live in very much an agrarian society, you've done product, projects in, um, I think I might pronounce this wrong, um, Solovki? Yes. And Transylvania. And yes. I was really struck by how our modern ways of living seem so incompatible with bygone ways where people did live in harmony with the lands and they were farming um, and there were lots of other species that were occurring within that landscape. So when you have when you have worked in places such as this, have yeah. you found that it's difficult to kind of bring together the components of the modern way of living and obviously that, that bygone era um, in a bit beneficial way or do you just find that it's kind of one compromise after another when you're trying to modernise? Well, it, uh, it's a, a really interesting point and, um, and somewhere like Solov Key, which is um, right up on the Russian Arctic Circle, um, was um, a place where because people were living right on the edge of survival um, and it was the most sacred Russian monastery. They were really attuned to environmental issues uh, and what what would survive and how you could manage the land to get through those six months of winter. But at the same time, they were extremely innovative. So um, they, in order to um, get, uh, drain enough um, swamps to grow enough pasture to provide enough hay to support enough um, livestock to produce enough dung to uh, fertilize the vegetable gardens to get them through the winter. Um, they did things like link up um, lakes um, through the whole archipelago. And I think it's one of the first places that they used um, hydroelectric power. So just just because one's moving with technology doesn't mean that one can't work with nature. And somewhere like Transylvania, where it's producing the most extraordinary combination of very productive farming with um, maximum biodiversity, there is a sense of um, human well-being and human sanity that goes with that, which doesn't stop you having internet and um, washing machines and, um, and and so on and so forth. But it's, it's using um, natural systems in order to make human life possible. So I, I think technology can help us um, uh, live more comfortable lives, but it doesn't preclude living well with nature. No. So thinking about an area where there are obviously lots of people and they're very much immersed in the modern way of living although the landscape has remained relatively unscathed um, because of the people who have kind of designed the landscape and put the gardens in place um, yeah. I was really interested in your Thames landscape strategy um, which it, hopefully people will read the book and, and read more about this um, but I suspect that that is a massive project uh, but could you just give a brief overview of, of what it is and how it might shape the area where it is over the coming years? Yes, I mean, it is it, it is huge, partly um, because it covers um, the first 18 and a half kilometres of the Thames path through London, and partly because it came up with a strategy for 100 years. And, um, and really, if you are planning a landscape, you've got to look a minimum of 100 years ahead um, in order to really um, get into balance all of the things that you need to do. What what was remarkable about that was that it involved four different boroughs, each of different political persuasions, um, about 30 different national authorities, and then over 200 local interest groups. But it started really with the local interest groups. And what I found was that there is an understanding, an instinctive understanding of landscape, which brings together all of us um, at, at an immediate level of what we care about in our surroundings and in, and, and in the spaces that we share. My apologies, we had a small technical difficulty at this point in the interview, but we pick up again here where I speak about something that's caused debate and even contention historically, as people argue the case for and against. It does bring me on to the question of our gardens art, and if they are, 
how far do we take that expression of our creativity in terms of how we use the landscape and the natural materials do we need to sacrifice some of them you know some of the some of our expression of creativity because we're mindful of what we're doing to the landscape in the process yeah i i've wrestled with the whole question of um landscape architecture and art a bit and um rather arbitrarily, uh, I feel that art is a, a fascinating observation of the world, but it, the artist tends to stand at one step removed and, and comment on what he or she sees um, and brings it into sharp perspective um, from that one step removed. And as a landscape architect, I think you can't indulge in that kind of separation. Um, what we're what we're dealing with are such valuable natural resources that we have to be artful in in how we deal with them, and we can express um, elements of of our own time and our own philosophy. But our our first obligation is to um, how the land is is managed and used and enjoyed in every different aspect, um, ecologically, economically, um, and in human psychology as well. So I, I think we can't we can't separate ourselves from our physical oblig- obligations with the land, and we can't just be artists. No, uh, because I was thinking about um, particularly your work with landforms. And again, I think you mentioned in your book that it's um, it's lovely to be able to work with landowners who've got those kind of resources to, to build landforms. And those kind of gardens will be there conceivably for centuries because they are so dramatic and, and, that's, and they're a legacy, really. Um, but I do wonder in the modern world, can we justify these extravagant landscapes? Um, you know, and if so, how? Well, it's really interesting that you use the word extravagant. Um, I have to say one of the cheapest ways of being um, artistic and sculptural with the land is land forming. I mean, it, it really just takes a good digger driver um, and moving some earth around. And if, if you think... Um, what you can create and what has been created for thousands of years with um, sculptural landforms, they um, they absolutely aren't extravagant by comparison with um, horticultural gardens. Um, if, if you think about it, these, the, the great landforms of um, Salisbury Plain and um, Avery Ring and so on are actually just grazed by animals. And um, whereas to have an equivalent area of intense parterres um, is is very expensive and requires huge teams of um, of gardeners and um, and often chemicals and so on and so forth. So, so actually, the um, particularly in landscapes of chalk and grass and easy rainfall, um, they're they're not expensive um, landscapes to to produce. And I think the key is um, to understand their spiritual significance and their their ability to provide places for people to gather and um, celebrate or worship um, and uh, and really um, be sensitive to things like the fantastic long twilights that we get this far north. Um, and the way that grass does grow, and and the fact that you don't have to mow them within an inch of their lives, that they can be um, tremendous areas um, of uh, wildflowers um, and um, uh, insect um, interest too. So I actually think um, in, in terms of um, artistic and sculptural design, they're probably one of the least extravagant and um, most... Um, uh, multi-functional uh, landscapes that we can create. Mm. Yeah, I think extravagant was the wrong word. I was probably thinking more about the resources involved because you are 
literally cutting into the land and changing the whole landscape. Um, but yes, that's exactly, I suppose, the answer I was looking for, that, that sometimes it's, it's okay to actually use a space for humans. Um, and as you say, you're not completely excluding other species. But obviously there are, there are some kind of, um, I suppose you, you have to make some concessions when you're installing just turf. Um, I'm guessing that kind of a, a landform generally doesn't lend itself to just being left to go completely wild. There is an element of mowing, there is an element of keeping it weed free because keeping that green uh, sward is, is really what makes it ultra dramatic. If we do that kind of thing, do we need to counterbalance that in other areas of the garden that we're working in? Well, I mean, just, uh, just um, I would, uh, um, I just challenge that, that, that the idea of it being um, sort of perfect um, uh, weed-free turf is is actually not the tradition of um, British landforms, that especially if you're using um something like chalk as a as a sub base, you need very little um, soil on top of it um, in order to to grow what can be the the, the richest of um, wildflower meadows and and then and on those um, on those steep slopes you then only need to mow it for for hay once a year um, and and you you have that combination of um, beautiful sort of moving um, long grasses and um, and wild flowers during the summer, and then a sculpted form when the light is at, at its um, most oblique during the winter, and when you can get um, frost on it. So, so I think the idea that they're um, uh, hyper um, verdant um, green lawns is is the wrong way of approaching um, landform. Sculpture much better to take advantage of the of, of the shallow topsoil and the steep slopes to grow really interesting wildflowers, um, and then and then you only have to mow them once a year, or on the ones that you want to keep really trimmed, you use um, solar powered remote um, control um, mowers, which uh, are very good for steep slopes. Mm, that's interesting I think Keith Wiley I went to a talk with Keith Wiley and he was saying how actually the slopes because he's he's uh, reformed his entire patch of land and he said the slopes are where the most interesting things happen so yeah that's yeah, uh, definitely a good thing to bear in mind the problem is also um things like bank voles think the slopes are the, the most um, desirable residences <laughs> too so <laughs> okay. you, you so have you have a lot of enough. nature to contend with <laughs> <laughs> fair enough <laughs> um so kind of moving on to your um your garden at the natural history museum which is mm. obviously a much more urban site um yeah. i thought it was really interesting that the, the gardens on the western side have been designed to reflect how our urban spaces will look in the future and the role that they'll fulfill how do you see urban green spaces performing performing as a natural resource as as things get more squeezed and and we do suffer with things as you say like climate change i th- i think um it is it's one of the that together with um how we farm our land uh, is one of the biggest issues of our time um and um, and that there will be ways of dealing with fossil fuels and finding alternative energy supplies and batteries and so on. But the biggest, biggest question is how we use land and, and how we keep human beings from going completely insane in concrete jungles. So um, the what we're exploring or what I hope will be explored at the Natural History Museum is the three elements of, of land, which is um, soil, water, and and air, um, and how how each precious space within the urban environment um, can um, absorb water, um, take it down, clean it, and take it down into the aquifer. How it can um, recycle um, leaves and nutrients to to create a microbially rich soil, which in turn provides life for the insects, um, and then in in the air, how they can carry on pollinating um, trees and how trees actually form 
a really valuable role in removing particulates from the air and, and cleaning the air. So I think we we have to think of our urban spaces as needing to do lots and lots of different things all at once um, to do with restoring the um, atmosphere, keeping wildlife alive, um, and stopping human beings from going mad, um, and also being beautiful and spiritually uplifting at the same time. So it's it's not a small order, um, and, and I think um, Victorian ornamental parks played a real role um, in their day, but we now need to be much more... Um, demanding of uh, and respectful of what our, our open spaces in cities can achieve. And one one thing that I'm particularly keen on is um, as, as climate and weather becomes more turbulent, um, the role, the ancient role of floodplains within cities needs to be respected as well. And, um, and places like Petersham Meadow in Richmond and the, the meadow, Christchurch Meadow and Port Meadow in Oxford and the backs in Cambridge show a way of, of managing flood land um, in the most beautiful um, Arcadian way with um, grazing cattle um, that um, which really calm people down. They, they're often the most popular places in the country um, and, and yet are um, Cheap to maintain and extremely good for biodiversity. So I think it's it's thinking laterally into understanding all of those natural systems and all of the functions that they provide in in creating urban spaces, and also um, to meet the huge demand for allotments, so that people um, with smaller gardens or living in apartments actually can have contact with soil and grow things. Mm. Well, I thought that was very interesting in your Chelsea Barracks design and also the, the, the garden that you've put in, uh, that you're designing for Oman. Um, you have incorporated vegetable gardens inside the, the towns or the, the, the developments. Um, and I was wondering, who would be responsible for maintaining those vegetable gardens? Would they be completely run by committee and would the, the produce go directly back to the people who live there? Well, it, it, in in each of the different places, it it, it depends. So, um, in Oman, um, it'll it'll very much be um, the city there is designed with, I think, two hundred linear uh, kilometres of um, vegetable and date palm terraces, which will partly be um, for for local people to use, partly for commercial growers to use, um, partly as we're building a city for. 250,000 people um, for the people, the construction workers to have um, a place to grow food while they're working on the city. So it's a combination of all of those in Oman. Um, at Chelsea Barracks, the affordable housing um, is to have uh, allotments and the unaffordable housing um, with the um, main vegetable, 100 meters of vegetable garden um, or culinary garden through the middle is to be maintained by um, uh, professional gardeners and then the produce to be sold either in the restaurant or a farmer's market. Um, so, and, and actually at Oxford Botanic Garden, where um, vegetables demonstrates how to grow vegetables as well, the, the food is given to the Oxford Food Bank. So I think there are lots of different ways of, um, of growing and, and distributing the food. Um, to suit the situation of uh, wherever these urban plots are. And you're actually creating skilled jobs for people as well. Exactly. Mm. And and also, I think the really interesting thing about food is, is so often it's, it's just described as food. But the difference between perishable food and storable food is enormous. And perishable food, such as salads... Um, don't need very much soil, but they do need an awful lot of um, of labour. And because they're perishable, you need to grow them where they're going to be eaten. So for a lot of things like that, um, growing uh, food directly inside cities makes an awful lot of sense. It's where you've got labour, where you people are eating it, and where it doesn't need great acres of, um, of arable land. Hmm. 
Yeah, makes perfect sense. Do you think we've got the labour force available? Yes. Uh, I'm just you just have to look at the huge demand for allotments and the waiting lists in um, in London to understand how many people would rather go and work on allotments than lock themselves into a cellar gym. Um, and and the demand, um, I think, among young young people to have some engagement with growing things and with farming is is enormous now. And and the more that we become digitally um, uh, focused, the more the, the need for contact with the, the natural world and growing food becomes pressing. And my last question was going to be, it's almost a selfish question really, uh, because as a designer, I, I, I'm always struggling with this question myself. And, and that is, you know, who are you designing for? Is it the client, the environment, yourself? Does it depend on the project? It becomes almost whose project is it? And I always think personally that I am almost channeling people's creative vision. And that is because a lot of the gardens that I'm working on now are more well-being gardens and there are lots of stakeholders involved and they and I need to kind of involve them to know what they want. Um, but, you know, is it is that the job of a designer, do you think, to just channel other people's creativity or do you think they should be looking to express themselves through a design? I think, I think wanting to express your, uh, oneself as a designer is, is a bad start. Um, mm-hmm. um, I think because um, we talked about time frame and, and because I'm usually thinking about 100 years ahead with designs, I guess um, it may sound slightly flippant, but I, I think I'm designing for the land and for future generations on the land rather than immediate stakeholders. So I, I think it's it's trying to take a very long-term environmental perspective on what what the land needs and what human beings on that land um, deserve. And and that's that's also looking back a long way to understand the stories and the um, the spiritual engagement that human societies have had with a place, um, and and pushing it forward to think how that can continue, and then coming up with something that triggers the imagination that seems to respond to all of those past and future. Um, connections and yet meets current um, needs of, of the moment. Um, so it is, I think the moment you take real time perspective into landscape architecture, um, it, it comes up with its own set of criteria and um, imaginations and um, inspirations that at the same time need to be intensely practical. Intense practicality has to be built into designs that will work for people and the existing landscape and stand the test of time, which, when you think about it, is a monumental task. And Kim is such a good inclusion in the Design Expert series for the reason that he does bring all of this responsibility to bear in his projects. If you're interested in his work, his book, Led by the Land, has just been updated and expanded, and you can get it in all the usual places. And no, I'm not being paid to publicise Kim's book. But I am being paid to publicise the London College of Garden Design, so go check out their website, lcgd.org.uk. And a big thanks to them for sponsoring the episode. My huge thanks go to Kim Wilkie for taking part, and thanks very much to you for listening. I will not catch you next Tuesday, as I'm taking the next two Tuesdays off, so I wish you all a happy Christmas and all the very best for the new year. The podcast will be back on the 7th of January and I'll be kicking off the new year with some more really spectacular guests. So if you don't already, please subscribe to the podcast so you don't miss out on any. I'd like to thank you for all your support this year. You've been amazing and I will catch you in 2020. You can download or listen to the podcast direct from the website www.rootsandall.co.uk where you'll also find my blog and a sign up form for the newsletter which gives you a weekly roundup of content, plus the inside scoop on things like upcoming guests. Or you can subscribe wherever you normally get your podcasts. Email me with comments and feedback at podcast at rootsandall.co.uk. 
Follow me on Twitter, Roots and All, Facebook, Roots and All UK, and Instagram, Roots and All Pod. But please also check out my Patreon, where you can make a one-off donation or take out a monthly subscription to help support my work, because if you like what I do, please help me to continue doing it. Even if you make a one-off donation of a pound, trust me, it all helps, and I will be immensely grateful. So please go to Patreon and search for Roots and All.